Welcome to my feature comparison section of the All-in-One Flight Controller Roundup. In the All-in-One Flight Controller Roundup, we're going through as many of the current crop of all-in-one clean flight, beta flight, flight controllers that we can. And in a previous video, I went through all of them and gave you a list of their features and discussed the pros and cons of each one and it culminated in picking which one or ones I thought were the best, at least by my standards. And I encourage you to go ahead and watch that video. Uh, it's got a lot of information in it. In this section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the individual features that the boards have and how those features distinguish the boards, which boards have which features and what else about those boards is similar and different. So the idea behind this video is that if you've got a single feature that maybe you care the most about, like black box logging, or maybe you want a board that includes a video transmitter, then you can watch this video and see a short list of what boards might fit that need. Let's get into it. Almost all of the boards in this roundup have an OSD, but not all OSDs are created equal. As far as I'm concerned, if you're running Betaflight, you really want to be running the Betaflight OSD. The Betaflight OSD has several advantages over MWOSD, which is what we all used to fly. Well, some of us flew KVOSD, but basically all those ones that run on a minimum OSD. The advantages of a Betaflight OSD are, number one, it is completely integrated into the flight control software. Every time you update Betaflight, you update the OSD. You never have to pull out your FTDI adapter and go through all the nonsense of flashing with Arduino or Xloader and do you need to cross the TX and the RX pins or not, etc., etc. Just plug in USB, flash Betaflight, away you go. And for me, that alone <laughs> might be enough to make me pick it. But the Betaflight OSD also has the ability to adjust all those special Betaflight specific parameters like the gyro filter and many clean flight parameters too, like min throttle. It just is more developed than MWOSD as far as I can see. MWOSD is not terrible though. In fact, MWOSD integration has improved with the serial pass-through feature that I did a video on. You no longer have to pull out your FTDI adapter just to do basic configuration. However, you still need to pull out your FTDI adapter in order to flash new firmware to MWOSD boards. And I ran into this recently when I had to update a board with a new, I had a pre-released version of the board. I had to update the firmware to fix a bug. And I consider myself to be reasonably computer savvy, but it was still a real pain in the butt to get it working. The Brain FPV technically is running Betaflight OSD, but it's actually sort of running Betaflight OSD in a sandbox. It actually is its own OSD with a whole bunch of additional features on top of the Betaflight OSD. In fact, the Brain FPV's OSD existed. It was originally developed for DRONIN, and it was only later that Betaflight was added. So with Brain FPV, you have everything that Betaflight OSD has. And in addition to that, it has advanced features like you can see in the upper right-hand corner here, real-time spectral display during flight. How about that? That's pretty cool. I don't know if you're going to be watching that while you're flying. Maybe on DVR, you would watch it on playback or something. Anyway, it's got all these other cool features that really only it has. Finally, TBS has a custom OSD. Uh, it is it is a traditional OSD. It doesn't have the super sexy features like Brain FPV has. It does have the ability to change the uh, transmit power and the channel of the video transmitter if you're using the FP Vision. So here are the boards that have the Betaflight and the CleanFlight OSD and the major characteristics that make them stand out from each other. The Siren is the only one of these boards that has Betaflight OSD and a video transmitter built in. However, it doesn't have a voltage regulator and it doesn't have current or RSSI input. The Omnibus F3 does not have a current sensor. This is fixed in the Omnibus F3 Pro, which has Betaflight, OSD, an SD card reader, and a current sensor, all the things I could ask for. The Brain FPV RE1 is an F4 board. That certainly makes it stand out. So are the Omnibus F4 and the Kiwi. The Brain FPV has the Brain OSD, and it can control TBS Unify video transmitter from its OSD, so that's cool. The Omnibus F4 does not have an SD card reader in the current version that's on the market. A version with an SD card reader is coming soon. Currently, it has 16 meg of data flash, and it does not have current sensing. The Kiwi does not have an SD card reader. It does have 16 meg of data flash, and it does have current sensing. And then we've got the SP Racing F3 Evo combined with the CleanFlight OSD and PDB, which has all of the above. 
What if a video transmitter is the number one thing you're concerned with? These boards have a video transmitter. The Siren is adjustable from 25 to 200 milliwatts. It has the Betaflight OSD. It is the only one of these boards with an SD card reader. However, you do have to solder on a VTX pigtail. It does not have an U a UFL or SMA connector to just screw on a pigtail. The Passato from Furious FPV has fixed 25, 200, and 600 milliwatts. Again, this is a pre-release product, and that may change between now and the time it's actually released. It is an MWOSD setup. It's not Betaflight OSD, but it does have the ability to adjust the video transmitter from within the, the flight controller and the OSD. The FlyPro Tower, it is controlled by a push button on the side of the board, not through the OSD. It runs MWOSD, and it has BL Heli ESCs on board. So if you're looking for something with a video tra transmitter and BL Heli ESCs, this could be the choice for you. And the TBS Power Cube and FP Vision has adjustable transmit power from 25 to 800 milliwatts. It has two camera inputs, real-time switchable. It has the TBS OSD and BL Heli ESCs. If you're looking for boards that have ESCs, here they are. The FlyPro Tower has 30 amp BL Heli ESCs. The Racer Cube has 20 amp BL Heli ESCs. KISS, of course, has KISS ESCs in 12, 18, or 24 amps. The Raptor 390 All in One Tower has 20 or 30 amp BL Heli ESCs. And as you'll recall, we couldn't figure out whether those were BL Heli or BL Heli S. And then the TBS Power Cube plus FP Vision, they have BL Heli ESCs. Interestingly, they're running an AT Mega 8 processor which usually means bad performance, but they have a lot of custom supporting hardware like gate drivers and so forth that they say makes up the deficits of the AT Mega processor and actually lets these ESCs perform very well. Here's a breakout of which boards have the 6000 or 6050 chip, which is the quote unquote good ones, and the 6500 or the 9250 chip. These are the less good ones. I wouldn't reject a board just because it has the 6500 or the 9250 if you really love it. But if there are two boards that are more or less the same, I would always take the one that has the 6000 or the 6050. Some boards with the 6500 or the 9250 perform very well, but it's kind of a crapshoot sometimes to know what you're going to end up with, whether you're going to have problems. And I feel like choosing the 6000 or 6050 is, is, is good insurance to help you avoid potential problems in the future. What about motor outputs? Now, all these boards, of course, have at least four motor outputs. And if you run a quadcopter, you might say, well, what do I need more than four motor outputs for? Have you ever lifted a pad or damaged a motor output in a crash? It happens. And if you've got extra motor outputs, you can use a custom motor mix to, instead of using motor outputs one, two, three, four, use one, two, three, five. And then you can keep using the board instead of throwing it out. So it's, and of course, some people might be flying a hexacopter, right? That still happens. People still do that, right? So boards with more than four motor outputs include the Siren, Omnibus F3, F3 Pro, and F4, the SP Racing Evo, and the Brain FPV. The Brain FPV has six motor outputs if you run Betaflight and eight if you run D-Ronin. And there are a few other distinguishing characteristics like that the Siren has a video transmitter, the F4 does not have an SD card reader, and the Evo combo includes a PDB. If you fly Spectrum, this is the slide for you. Which of these boards support Spectrum Satellite? Now, there's three ways I claim that a board could support a Spectrum Satellite. They could have an actual Spectrum Satellite jack that you can just plug that little pigtail header into. Some of them have a pads for Spectrum Satellite, but they haven't installed the actual little plastic jack, and you have to direct solder the wire to it. Well, that shouldn't bother you too much, right? And then some boards have 3.3 volt output, but they don't actually have a Spectrum satellite header at all. And you just solder to 3.3 volts and you solder to a UART with your Spectrum satellite receiver. All of the boards in this roundup support Spectrum satellite in some form, except for the FlyPro tower and the Raptor F390 tower. I couldn't determine that those boards had a 3.3 volt output. They might, I just couldn't confirm it. Some third party Spectrum satellite receivers can take five volts, in which case, you could put them on any board of these boards. They all output 5 volts. And all you need is a UART to run Spectrum Satellite. There's nothing special about it. It's just a serial protocol. What about pins versus pads? If you like to direct solder, you might prefer a board that has these nice pads instead of through holes. And four boards in the roundup, three of which are pictured here, have these pads. They are the Kakute, the Radiance, the Kiss, and the HDLRC F3V 3.1 Pro. Say that three times fast. All the other boards have some combination of micro-connectors and through, hole, uh, through holes. And this is my favorite slide, which is the black box logging slide. I love black box logging. 
Boards with an SD card reader are the Siren, the Omnibus F3, the Omnibus F3 Pro, the Racer Cube, and the SP3 Evo. Boards with a data flash chip are the Omnibus F4, soon to have an SD card reader, but not currently, the Kiwi, and the Brain FPV. And then the other boards you see listed here do not have any black box logging built in. In theory, you could still hook an open log device up to these boards, but in reality, the speed of the UART will limit the logging to levels that are not very useful. So open log is just not that useful today, unless all, kind of all you want to do is just record stick overlays for playback. You just can't log fast enough anymore over a UART for the data to be very useful. I feel like a current sensor is mandatory on an OSD. I want to know how many amps I'm pulling, and I want to know when I'm done flying based on how many milliamp hours I discharged. Many people don't feel this way, and they are fine with just a voltage readout. If you are one of those people, then skip this slide. You don't care. Here are the boards that have current sensing built in. They're in this list over on the left. There are also some boards that you can use an external current sensor. They have an input for an external current sensor. So in theory, they support current sensing. But in reality, you're not going to install an external current sensor. I just know. So, uh, there's one guy out there who's done it. He's Quad McFly, right? <laughs> if, every, for everybody else, you're not going to do it, right? It's like you say you're going to brush your teeth and floss every night, but you don't. And you're not going to install a current sensor either. So as effectively, these boards don't support current sensing. But if you happen to have a current sensor or you have a PDB that supports current sensing, then maybe one of these boards can do it for you. And then finally, the Siren and the Fly Pro Tower don't support current sensing. They don't even support an external input. The Siren has a star next to it because the creators have told me that they could create a firmware that allowed it to have an external input. But I don't know that they have done it. And I, I wouldn't buy it based on the counting on that happening. Here are the boards that do or do not have RSSI input, or at least could not be confirmed to have RSSI input. This is mostly for your OSD. You're going to want to see your RSSI on the OSD. If you don't currently fly with a board that has RSSI or you're not used to seeing it, this may not be a big deal for you. I almost left this slide out because, frankly, I feel like having my Tyrannus say, you know, low RSSI is enough of a warning that. I don't need to see it on the OSD. Frankly, when I do have it on the OSD, I'm often so busy flying that I'm not glancing at it. And you can fly into a dead zone so quickly that you can be at 80% RSSI and then, boop, it can drop off really suddenly, potentially. So I don't feel like this is as big a deal as current sensing, but here it is. If you want RSSI on your OSD or in your flight controller, these are the boards that can do it. What about you folks like Matty Stunts who want to run 5S or 6S? Here are the boards that are capable of accepting 5S and 6S, and all the other boards except 4S or below, except the Siren, which takes 5 volts. As for processors, here are the boards that have an F4 versus an F3 processor. And let me tell you why I don't think this is as big a deal as some people think it is. When I showed people the Lumineer Lux V2, I thought it was a pretty solid board. And other people said, F3, who needs it? And I'm like, really, are we that over F3 boards? Because F3 boards can still run 8K, 4K, 8K, 8K gyro, 4K PID loop on Betaflight 3.0 and 301. And that's, I have many copters flying fantastic. And sure, an Omnibus or, or a Kiwi or a Brain FPV with an F4 processor in it is going to be more future proof. You're going to be running at Instead of 20 or 25% processor utilization, you're going to be running at like 3% processor utilization at 8K and 8K. But on the flip side, you give up a lot. There just isn't as much variety and selection and features in these F4 boards. So if you look at what the F4 boards bring to the table and you look at what the F3 boards bring to the table, you have so much more selection in the F3 boards. And I just, I wonder if it's really worth it today to buy an F4 if you're giving up so much just to future-proof yourself. And who knows? I mean, when will the point be when an F3 can no longer really compete? Is it in the amount of time it'll take you to finish flying this copter, crash it, destroy it, and move on to the next one? But don't buy an F1 board anymore. They're done. And then we come to price, of course, price. The most expensive boards here are the TBS PowerCube and FP Vision at $240. Now that gives you everything but the receiver, but it's almost as much as some copters. The FlyPro Tower at $130. Again, everything but the receiver. It has a few limitations compared to the TBS setup. It's not quite as perfectly integrated. 
but it's like a hundred dollars cheaper so uh, it's it's kind of competitive there's the brain fpv at 104 dollars and the siren fpv at 99 dollars and these ones don't even include escs the least expensive ones here are the sort of standalone boards the omnibus f3s the kakute the omnibus f4 the hdlrc and so on and that's going to bring us to the end of this feature comparison of the boards in my all-in-one flight controller roundup. If you haven't watched the main video where I go through every single one of these boards and tell you all the features and all my thoughts about them, including picking the best, I definitely encourage you to go ahead and do that. I hope that this has helped you decide which of these boards you might want to buy. And when you do buy it and get it into a copter, I hope that you have some happy flying.